Okay, supposedly I'm live. Let's hope so. Um, greetings to everybody today. Sure glad you could make it. And uh, hopefully a few more will join in as we're okay, going. And uh, oops. Uh, greetings to everybody today. Sure glad you could make it. Yeah. Unfortunately, <laughs> live stream plays back if you don't forget to. <laughs> exit out of the uh, browser so that's what was happening sorry about that all right um we're going to be studying first corinthians 9 today and um it's going to be talking about apostles and uh paul um you know lays down one of the marks of of an apostle uh starting in verse one am i not free am i not an apostle have i not seen jesus our lord are you not the result of my work in the lord even though i may not be an apostle to others surely i am to you for you are the seal of my apostleship in the lord so paul reminds them of what he taught in the last chapter Paul also has the freedom of Christ, of Christ because he's in Christ and he is his apostle. He asks them whether or not they consider him to be an apostle. Now, it's obvious from this verse that the early church had certain criteria for telling who a true apostle was. One of the more important criteria was whether or not a person claiming to be an apostle had actually seen Jesus Christ in the flesh. So we ask ourselves, had Paul? Yes, he had. He likely may have seen Jesus Christ while still on earth during the time that he was persecuting Christians, but it's certain that Paul saw Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father on the road to Damascus. And that account is in Acts 22, 6 through 11. I'll read that. About noon, as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuted, he replied. My companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do, Lord? I asked. Get up, the Lord said, and go into Damascus. There you will be told all that you have been assigned to do. My companions led me by the hand into Damascus because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. Now, obviously, this account tells of Paul seeing a bright light and hearing the voice of Jesus Christ. Uh, the people around him saw the light but didn't hear the voice. Notice that even though this account, this account doesn't say that Paul saw Jesus Christ, it's clear that Paul was listening to him. But Paul did see Jesus, and if it was Jesus who commissioned Paul, who was, by the way, the last of the apostles, that's 1 Corinthians 15, 9, which we'll look at later, uh, which speaks of Paul being the least of the apostles. And the word least means uh, the same thing as numerical order. For instance, 1 to 10, he would be number 10 or the last. So then Paul truly is an apostle and likely the replacement for Judas instead of Matthias because Jesus Christ could choose his 12. Now that's up for debate, but that's what I personally believe because I believe that Jesus is the only one who could actually choose his disciples. Notice that Paul saw Jesus in a vision in the temple after his Damascus Road experience. Now, before I get into it, I want to just comment. Matthias was a great guy, and he went out and witnessed for the Lord, and he was martyred. So in that sense, yeah, he's, he, he was an apostle, but not on the same level as Paul. There were 12 foundational apostles. And by the way, there are no more foundational apostles today. That's done. These guys who claim to be foundational of the church, are false apostles by definition. 
Acts 22, 17 through 18 says, when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying, praying at the temple, I fell into a trance and saw the Lord speaking. Quick, he said to me, leave Jerusalem immediately because they will not accept your testimony about me. In Paul's account, the King Agrippa of the Damascus Road experience, Paul indicates that he saw Jesus Christ. Acts 26, 12 through 19. On one of those journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. About noon, O King, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, uh, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute? It's hard for you to kick against the goads. Then I asked, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen of me and what I will show you. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. Back before this was all recorded in Acts, it's told that Barnabas took Paul to the apostles. It was there that he also related that Paul had seen Jesus. Uh, Acts 9.27 but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So it's clear that Jesus Christ himself had put his mark on Paul as the last foundational apostle. So there are no more foundational apostles today. So C.P. Wagner, he's right out. And people like that. Just as there were no more after Paul. There were a lot of people who came along saying, I'm a foundational apostle. I sat under the teaching of Jesus, et cetera, et cetera. But Paul condemned those who claimed to be foundational apostles. You guys are familiar with this verse, 2 Corinthians 11. 12 through 15 verses. And I will keep on doing what I'm doing in order to cut the ground from under those who want an opportunity to be considered equal with us in the things they boast about. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising then if his servants masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. Another mark of a true apostle, and this could be true of foundational apostles or the type of apostles we have today. By the way, we do have a type of apostle today, but we don't call them apostles because we don't want to confuse people. Uh, at least in biblical churches. Those who are apostles today would be people who are like church planting missionaries and evangelists, people who preach the gospel and plant churches and, uh, you know, continue to dis uh, disciple believers from those churches. Uh, those people can be called apostles in a sense because they're sent out ones. They've been commissioned to go out and preach the gospel. The mark or seal of an apostle is that they have borne the fruit of discipleship. Uh, look at these guys today. None of them have been <laughs> persecuted to death or put to death or burned at the stake or any of that stuff. And yet they're claiming to be some big anointed apostle. I tell you, stay far away from people like that. They are egotists, and their, their master is not the Lord. On to verse 3. This is my defense to those who sit in judgment on you. Don't we have the right to food and drink? 
don't we have the right to take a believing wife along with us, as do the other apostles and the Lord's brothers and Cephas? Or is it only I and Barnabas who must work for a living? Apparently, there was some grumbling about church planters having the right to ask for food and help from wives. So he uses Cephas as an example of one who was doing the Lord's work. He also reminds them that Paul and Barnabas didn't even ask for help because everywhere they went, they did tent making to provide the means for their ministries. Uh, when we first went out as, as uh, missionaries, I talked to our mission, our former mission, and asked them if I could continue to do tent making because we, we couldn't raise enough uh, uh, support in the time needed for us to go out there. And uh, they were willing to do that. And I was very thankful for it because uh, it really helped us for the first few years that we were out there. And uh, so I continued to do that. Um, here's what Paul said elsewhere, 1 Corinthians 4.12. We work hard with our own hands. When we're cursed, we bless. When we're persecuted, we endure it. Acts 18.3. And because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. In Acts 20, 34, you yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. I'm, it's, very, it's really something for someone to come along and they're basically supporting themselves and doing everything that they can do to support themselves. Not to say that the churches shouldn't be helping them out, and they should. Um, some churches were helping out more than others. The Philippians were uh, obviously helping, uh, but, uh, and it's not bad to ask for support. Uh, what I don't like is, um, you know, we would go on deputation from time to time and travel around the churches that were supporting us. And I would see other missionaries come in and their whole presentation was about money. <laughs> you know, putting a guilt trip on people and you really need to be supporting us, blah, blah, blah. I never have liked that. What I really, what we used to do is we would tell people, this is what we need, but not make it the, the issue. I would go in there and preach a gospel message or, or tell stories of the mission field or whatever um, instead and let people uh, come to their own conclusion as far as support. Unfortunately today though, you go to churches and you ask for support and um, they're just like, they really don't think about it. They don't think that <laughs> you actually need support. I remember going to a couple different gatherings on, on furlough and uh, we went there and they gave us nothing. <laughs> like, thanks for the nice uh, message, but uh, see you later. That's not how it used to be. Back in the day, uh, when a missionary came to your church, they, they didn't have to ask for money. You already knew that they needed support and help. That's not the way it is today. Well, just like in the Old Testament, the church should support those who have devoted themselves full-time to the Lord's work, even though it's also good for the leadership to earn what they can and not be idle. Uh, Thessalonians 3, 7 through 9, for you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked night and day, laboring and toiling so that we would not be a burden to any of you. We did this not because we do not have the right to, to such help, but in order to make ourselves a model for you to follow. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 9, uh, 14, uh, which, you know, we're looking at. In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. And 1 Thessalonians 2, 9. Surely you remember, brothers, our toil and hardship. We work night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preach the gospel of God to you. 
Well, these guys had no right to sit in judgment on Paul because he and Barnabas had gone beyond even what Christ allowed in order to be an example to both the church and those uh, those sent out. They were being an example by doing tent making. And that word is still used today. <laughs> when we talk about missionaries who are have a business on the side or whatever, are working. Uh, <clears throat> my wife taught, taught uh, kindergarten uh, for 20 some years while we were out on the field to help support it. Well, on to verse seven. Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and, is, and does not eat of its grapes? Who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk? Do I say this merely from a human point of view? Doesn't the law say the same thing? For it's written in the law of Moses, do not muzzle an ox while it's treading out grain. Is it about oxen that God is concerned? Surely he says this for us, doesn't he? Yes, this was written for us because when the plowman plows the, and the thresher threshes, they ought to do so in the hope of sharing the harvest. If we've sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? If others have this right of support from you, shouldn't we have it all the more? But we did not use this right. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. Paul then gives a concrete example from real life. Do the farmers muzzle the ox when he's harvesting with the farmer? That would be stupid because the ox would grow hungry, slow down, and eventually stop. And nothing would get harvested. Well, just so the minister of Christ deserves to share in the harvest, particularly in regards to his material needs. If money is being collected the goods and goods distributed, then the minister should have his share. Apparently, the Corinthian church had grown greedy and was not willing to share as was the custom of the early church. Also, there are apparently others who came by the church and got material support. And when Paul showed up, he was not given that support because he was working making tents while he was there. But that was not enough alone to sustain his needs for traveling, etc. Other churches were very generous to Paul. We know that from Philippians 4.15. Moreover, as you Philippians know in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. Well, that was a sad situation, obviously. Yet who deserves the most material support? Was it not Paul? And that's true today still. Churches that only focus on their own needs and their own local people are missing the mark. I've said this for years. A good, healthy church is one who doesn't just spend money on itself, but is willing to send money out to those who are not benefiting them personally. Um, they're the, like the strongest churches. I in, in the past, we've had some really big churches that were supporting us. But they were, they were so sending us about the same amount of support as some little tiny churches. A little tiny church out in the middle of Indiana in the cornfields that had 30 people. And they were sending us as much money as some of these big, huge churches. They were giving sacrificially. It was something else. But we get, need to give support to those who are sent out. But even though Paul was deserving of this type of material support, he didn't ask for it in person. Paul states that we, he would put up with anything from them in order not to hinder the gospel. But you know what? That was a rebuke to the Corinthian church. Going on to verse 13, don't you know that those who work in the temple get their food from the temple? And those who serve at the altar share in what is offered on the altar? In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. 
As mentioned above, this is a reminder that the body of Christ needs to help those who spend a lot of their time, if not all, their time in the ministry. You know, a, a pastor worth his salt is not going to be going to pastors.com and reading uh, messages by Rick Warren <laughs> off, off the computer. I, I have seen this personally. It's a person who actually spends quite a bit of time studying and preparing. I can guarantee you this, Angela's husband, Steve, does that. He really spends time preparing, you know, his messages. This is why today we're supported, uh, we're supposed to be, uh, to help support pastors and missionaries. Yet many churches will only support the pastor and building projects and staff. The missionaries are given little help at all. And that's just not right. The pastor should also not receive the lion's share of what's given in offerings to the church. Uh, I don't agree with pastors being involved in the financial aspect of their churches at all. They should have nothing to do with it. They should hire somebody who can take care of the finances separately. But you know, these big big guys on TV, oh, they got their hands all over the money. The money and goods that come in should be there to help whoever needs help. And those in ministry need to help those who have regular jobs and make money. On to verse 15, but I have not used any of those rights. And I'm not writing this in the hope that uh, uh, you will do such things for me. I'd rather die than have anyone deprive me of this boast. Yet when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, for I'm compelled to preach. Woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. If I preach voluntarily, I have a reward. If not voluntarily, I'm simply discharging the trust committed to me. What then is my reward? Just this, that in preaching the gospel, I may offer it free of charge and so not make use of my rights in preaching it. Wow. There's a statement for you. Well, Paul again states that he has not demanded that they support him. He's setting an example for those in ministry that they should follow him and support themselves if at all possible. He takes great, great pride in that fact to the point that he would rather die than stop being able to make an example for him. You know, you'll notice that Jacob often mentions that uh, a lot of their materials are given away for free. Uh, a number of us switched over into that mode. Uh, everything, almost everything that I have is free up on YouTube or RTN. All the videos are free. All the articles are free. There's only a few things that I'm selling, uh, such as books, which actually cost money to produce. And so I have to charge enough to where I can then go on to the next printing. But that's the only reason why. Uh, so, you know, we kind of take pride in that. Yeah, we're you know, we often get people say, oh, you're charging money. Well, you do have to charge money for books, but we're giving away everything now. It used to be part of my support was charging for CDs and DVDs. Well, now I hardly sell any of them. Once in a while I do. Uh, but, you know, that's something that, that we kind of try to follow on with. Well, then Paul goes on to make an important point. Those who are in ministry should not be in it to enrich themselves. They should be there because God called them and they can do no other. We're there because this is what we're supposed to be doing. We're not here to make money. We're not here to pile up a whole mountain of envelopes and pray over them all. I'm praying for everybody. What a what a bunch of bunk that is. You see that on TV, TVN. And we know, of course, from, from 
you know, stories of people that they've got people just slitting open the, up, up, uh, the, the envelopes and taking out the checks and cashing them. And they could care less about what's written in them. Now, that to me is just deceitful. Paul says, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Paul knows that his reward is in heaven and on earth for preaching voluntarily. His reward on earth is that he offers the message of freedom in Christ without charge. His reward in heaven, of course, is a crown of glory. 1 Peter 5, 2 through 4 says, Be shepherds of God's flock that's under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you're willing, as God wants you to be. Not greedy for money, but eager to serve. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. There are many in Christendom today who are making a lot of money off of something that should be offered for free. And that's the truth of it, folks. This is why all the articles on my site are free. I, as I said, I only charge for materials that cost me to produce. produce. Um, but when you go beyond providing for the ability to produce materials and providing for your own needs, not wants, then I would question if what you're doing is biblical. Paul says we should be offering the gospel and teaching for free. Um, this is why, hopefully I won't make somebody mad, but I'm not a big fan of these Bibles. Here's the John MacArthur Bible or the Rick Warren Bible, the Benny Hinn Bible. Oh, really? <laughs> that bugs me. And I don't like it when people buy Bibles and they're reading all the commentary instead of reading the Bibles. That's not right either. That should be a separate issue. If a person wants to read a commentary that goes along with what they're reading, that's fine. But they need to actually be reading the scripture and thinking about it and meditating on it. I know a number of Christian leaders who travel all over the world helping people and don't even ask for airfare. By the way, Jacob Prash was one of those. I asked him, a, a couple different times to come out to the islands. He didn't ask for anything. Then said, yeah, I'll come. Flew right out there. He was willing to come, up, come and fly out there and go all over Micronesia, and he would have done so if they had actually welcomed him to do it. And I really wish that he'd been able to do that because now they're mired in heresy. It's, it's sad. Yet the Lord provides for those people who are willing to do that. And, you know, and people are led to help them. I admire this very much and I strive to do the same. When I find others in need, I try to help them in observance of the New Testament mandate to help one another in the body of Christ. James 2.16 says, if one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well and fed and does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? Now, of course, I always struggle with this verse, as I'm sure you do, when you're accosted by people on the street. <laughs> you want to help them, but then again, you kind of have to make a uh, value, you know, a decision. Whether this person is just panhandling or do they really need help? And, you know, we often have to do that. And, uh, you know, you don't want to support somebody's drug habit or alcohol habit by giving them money. One thing I really liked was when I was living uh, in Oregon, we used to go downtown or downtown Portland, <laughs> where you could actually go down there. And, uh, you know, there's so many homeless down there. And we would go down and instead of giving them money, we would offer to take them and get them a meal. <laughs> I always liked that one because that was something concrete that they actually needed 
and they probably wouldn't have spent the money on it. Acts 2, 44 through 45 says all believers were together and every, with everything in common, selling their positions and good, goods they gave to anyone as he had need. This is the way we should be today as well. This doesn't mean you have to sell everything you own. But the early church did sell things they own in order to provide for those who were in need, including the leaders. I can tell you some stories about growing up in Micronesia, but uh, it's a different kind of culture. They're not like Americans who basically, Americans uh, basically believe that they have to have, ver they have to be completely self-sufficient and have everything they need and so they're much less likely to uh, <laughs> help other people and give them stuff that they have. Whereas in Micronesia, I was on a boat with one of the pastors one day, and we were going out to, to fish, and he said, I really like that mask. Give it to me. <laughs> because they don't really have a word for please. And uh, <laughs> I was kind of shocked. But I thought, you know what? This is a, a society where they have reciprocity, and uh, that's how we operate. Uh, everybody doesn't own everything. Certain people have certain things, and when you need them, you go ask for them, and you know you keep it for as long as you need it. Well, I did that, and sure enough, it wasn't too long before he came back. He gave me a spear gun that he had made for me personally. So, you know, I learned something from that, that uh, in some ways, their society is kind of has their act together. On to verse 19, though I'm free and belonging to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law. So as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I'm not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law. So as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I become all things to all men, so that by all possible means, I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. You know, we're free in Christ, but we are also slaves of Christ. You have to remember that. In being servants of Christ, we should be servants for our fellow believers. We should also give up our own agenda to reach others for Christ. In verses 20 to 23 are often taken out of context by many today. Paul was not th saying that he would give up the principles of the word of God to reach people. He's stating that he will obey the laws of whoever he's with in order that he would not cause, cause others to sin. When Paul was with the Jews, he observed Jewish customs. When he's with the Gentiles, he did the same. But he would never do anything against the word of God or the good conscience because that too would not be a good witness. So you know what, uh, the concrete, concrete examples. I remember years ago hearing about certain churches that were sending people out to bars, to taverns, to witness to people <laughs> and drinking with them. Well, you know what, if you're a former alcoholic, you don't go into bars to witness. That's because you may be dragged back into your addiction. Or you're, you're basically giving a bad example to those who are addicted. But I know people who do that and they think they're following Paul's example. Paul didn't do that kind of thing, nor should we. He didn't go into pagan temples and have sex with temple prostitutes in order to win people to Christ. That would be attempting to do one thing while committing a sin in order to do it. That's what we call means to an end. I'm actually doing a DVD right now 
that talks about how all this stuff in the New Apostolic Word of Faith, not only is are the means bad, but the end is bad. They're all bad. But, you know, it would be useless to be committing sin in order to preach the gospel. Paul would observe Jewish laws, even though in Christ he was free from them. He would do this in order to bring the good news to Jews to free them from the impossibility of observing the law of Moses in order to be saved, which is impossible. And by the way, it was never that, the law that saved people. If anything, the law was supposed to bring people to the point of confessing their sins and repenting of their sins to recognize that they were sinners. There was no way. They could have a relationship with the Lord. But salvation is by faith alone. That's how the patriarchs in the faith were saved. was because of their faith. Abraham and the others, Job, etc. And of course, Hebrews 11 talks about that. this. So... Paul would observe the laws of the Gentiles to witness to them, keeping in mind that he was under the law of Christ. You know, that's what we should do today. We need to be obeying the laws that our government sets down. But when they conflict with what the word of God says, hey, the word of God has the upper hand. And we may be persecuted because of it, but that's part of our witness as well. In any case, our highest goal ought to be 